The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has officially been approved in Canada, with 249,000 doses expected by the end of the year. Health Canada made the announcement on Wednesday after a two-month review process of clinical trial data. This comes as a growing number of Canadians are showing signs of vaccine hesitancy. According to a recent poll by Liget and the Association for Canadian Studies, only 28% of Canadians are willing to take the first vaccine available, while 45% say they will wait for other vaccines to come out. Well, to address Canadian concerns today, we are joined by Dr. Martin Fried, the lead scientist behind the Vaccine Research Initiative at the World Health Organization. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Fried. Now, we commissioned an online poll asking Canadians what their top concerns are regarding this vaccine. And one of the top Canadian concerns that we've observed is the effectiveness and safety of this vaccine, considering its accelerated approval. So how can Canadians be sure that it's safe? And what about long-term effects from this treatment? Okay, thank you. These are very good questions that the Canadians have. <clears throat> Let's, let me put them to rest, certainly uh, beginning with the efficacy. It is rare that we see a vaccine with such efficacy. So the Pfizer studies have shown that the vaccine has a 95% efficacy within a, the relatively short period of the study. But this is really quite rare for a vaccine. 95% is excellent. So this is a very efficacious vaccine. And that's against infection. When we look at the number of people who got hospitalized or who even died, it is even greater than 95%. So the vaccine is highly efficacious. Now, what can we say about safety? Up to now, 43,000 people have received this vaccine in the clinical trials. And so far, the safety looks very good. This means that we've seen some minor adverse events, some pain, some, some fatigue, some mild fever. This is normal for many vaccines, but we have not seen any what we call severe adverse events at a rate which is greater than that of the group receiving the placebo. So within the time period of the data we generated, this vaccine is both efficacious and appears safe. Now, this vaccine is the first of its kind in many ways in terms of how fast it was developed and how it uses mRNA, something that has never been done before. So can you tell us a little bit more on how exactly this vaccine works and if it has any effects on a person's DNA? Okay, again, very good question. We've been trying to do this for years, that to be able to use, instead of instead of injecting protein, or even worse, the whole pathogen, the whole virus, and what we used to do, we used to grow the virus up and kill it and inject that. And then we, we, we learned how to take parts of the virus and grow that up and inject that. That required us to add all kinds of additives like, anti, like, uh, like adjuvants. What we're doing now with mRNA is we are expressing just the same way that the virus does. The virus contains RNA. And when the virus goes into the cell, that RNA is expressed. Unfortunately, lots of the RNA is expressed. Here, we're just putting in the RNA that codes for the coat protein, the part of the protein that the body is going to see. So essentially, we are presenting to the body the virus without the dangerous parts of the virus. And it's being grown inside the body in a very safe way. So this is an excellent way of inducing an immunity in the body, that is, the body is going to see the virus just as if the virus was in the body. That is very good. Now this question, can this cause genetic modification? The answer is no. First of all, uh, we, the body does not really have a mechanism whereby it can convert the messenger RNA back to DNA. There are some enzymes, very low levels, but there's lots of mRNA in the, in the cells. There's, and when the virus comes into the cell, there's lots of RNA too. So the probability that this happens and then that that DNA gets into the nucleus and then that that DNA is incorporated into the genome, that's not going to happen. So in terms of genetic um, modification, we are absolutely safe. Now, Dr. Fried, we've got about a minute left, but what about virus mutations? We know we have to take a new flu shot every year to address uh, mutations to the flu virus. So does this mean we're, we're going to be seeing a modified COVID-19 vaccine every year, like the annual flu vaccine? So for the moment, we don't know. But the scientists suspect that the answer is probably no, certainly not every year. The virus does mutate, but it does not mutate at the same rate that the influenza virus mutates. And the it, virus does not have the mechanism whereby it can carry on binding to the parts of the cell that are necessary while it has these mutations. So for the moment, we think that this will certainly not be needed every year. Maybe it will be needed a few times in your lifetime. 
we're going to have to wait and see. All right, everyone, we, we have to take a quick short break, but we will return with more questions for Dr. Freed after the break. So stay tuned. All right, welcome back. We're here with Dr. Martin Fried, the lead scientist behind the Vaccine Research Initiative at the World Health Organization, answering your top questions and concerns around the newly approved COVID-19 vaccine by Pfizer-BioNTech. Now, Dr. Fried, in the UK, two NHS workers experienced allergic reactions after receiving the vaccine on Tuesday, and now the country is recommending those with severe allergies to avoid a shot. So what more do we know about this case and recent health recommendations from Pfizer and BioNTech? Okay, what we know is that these two individuals both had um, prior very severe allergic reactions. And because of that, they were both carrying EpiPens. Now, normally people like this are excluded from the clinical trials. And for most vaccines, we would say that if you are, sus if you are so subject to susceptibility to allergic responses, vaccines should be given really under medical supervision. So this is, of course, quite normal that we would now, having seen this information, give the alert and say, if you are really susceptible to severe allergic reactions, if you're carrying EpiPens, as an example, then you should discuss with your doctor. And if you're going to have this vaccine, either under medical supervision or maybe delay the vaccine. All right. And what about those who already got the virus and recovered from it, potentially gaining antibodies in the process? Would they still need this vaccine? Well, in the long run, yes, they will need the vaccine. Why? Because the vaccine induces a much higher titer of antibodies. There's more antibodies induced by the vaccine than by the infection. So we suspect that this will provide a longer lasting protection. I say we suspect. For the moment, we don't know for absolute certainty. So um, those that, had, that got infected and recovered, they are probably, again, we don't know, they are probably protected for a period of time, short time, moderate time, long time, we don't know, but they should get the vaccine. And what about once a person is vaccinated? What are the recommended protocols in terms of social distancing and masking moving forward? Certainly, we would recommend that they carry on be, be, rec, um, following the recommendations of the country, of the city, of wherever they are living, because it's going to become very difficult if people that are vaccinated suddenly stop wearing masks and people that are not vaccinated need to wear masks. We're going to it's going to be um, impossible for us to police this. So they should carry on following all of the recommended social distancing. Now, Dr. Freed, currently there is a lot of disinformation on the internet and an observed lack of trust overall about vaccines. So what are some ways to get people more comfortable with the idea of getting vaccinated? Well, I think uh, what we saw yesterday with the US FDA, they held a totally transparent public hearing with the company, with questions. I think this kind of thing is good. We need transparency. People need to see that this is not a money-making game behind everybody running to make money. We've had 70 million people infected, 1.5 million people have died. If we don't get the vaccine rolling out, if we don't get vaccine, vaccine, people vaccinated, we're just gonna have millions and millions more people dying. Sorry, that's all I can say. And in terms of who gets this vaccine, is there a recommended priority rollout from the WHO? Yes, for the moment, we have really prioritized healthcare workers, people that are working in, in the healthcare sector and older people, uh, because these are the people that are at the, at the greatest risk of getting severe disease and dying, and of course, healthcare workers transmitting the disease. And from then, through an age de-escalation process, also including, very importantly, people with, um, co with comorbidities, um, people with um, cardiac problems, renal problems, diabetes, etc. These are It's very important that they get the vaccine because they are at extremely high risk of dying if they get infected. And we've got about a little over a minute left, Dr. Freed, but Canadians also seem divided when it comes to making vaccine inoculation mandatory or voluntary. Does the WHO have any suggested guidelines on that? We don't. We don't. Mandatory vaccination tends not to be a very useful activity. Um, so we do not recommend that this becomes mandatory. Um, it, it does not, in most places, serve a good purpose. All right, Dr. Martin Fried, lead scientist behind the Vaccine Research Initiative at the World Health Organization. Thank you so much for giving us your time today, sir. My pleasure.